discovery of these molecules really has been one of the major discoveries in molecular biology over the last many, maybe 20 years. Our genome is very interesting. Uh, and apparently, the size of genome really does not correlate very well with the organism's complexity. And what I mean here, if you take, you know, fly or worm or plants or humans, the genome size really does not tell you much about the complexity of the organism. Furthermore, the number of genes in the genome really does not correlate with the organism complexity. And to give you an example, uh, the size of Drosophila, fruit fly, uh, not the size, the number of genes in Drosophila um, genome, or the number of, is very close to, you, to the number of genes in human genome. In C. elegans, which is warm, very, you know, commonly used model for uh, geneticists, uh, it's very close to the number of genes in human genome again. Uh, in fact, I think rice, rice that we eat has uh, a lot more genes than human genome. So we have roughly 20,000 protein coding genes in our genome. And rice has, I believe, something like 50,000, or at least there are predicted approximately 50,000 genes. And in fact, I think the largest number of genes uh, has a unicellular parasitic organism, uh, which is more than 60,000 genes. So there is absolutely no correlation between the number of genes and complexity of the organism. And in fact, only uh, about 2% of uh, our genome encodes for proteins, for prote those are protein coding genes, which tells you that 98% is something else. And uh, over many years, this 98% of genome has been regarded as some sort of a dark matter, sort of, you know, junk. It has been called as junk DNA. Something means something really maybe not even needed, certainly not studied very well. And over last years, this idea changes, and there are lots and more, lot, lots lots of people interested in this junk DNA. In fact, a uh, very vast majority of this junk DNA is translated to RNA. In humans, some people believe it's 60 percent, other people believe it's 80 percent, but it looks like really big portion of this uh, DNA material that is not encoded for proteins uh, is transcribed to RNA, and when it's transcribed to RNA, obviously it's probably uh, has, it sort of, a, you know, suggests that it may have a function. So uh, over the last 10 years or so, people become really a lot more interested in this uh, dark part of the genome and in this um, non-protein coding uh, part of the DNA and RNA. So microRNAs are the smallest nucleic acids, uh, ribonucleic acids. They are roughly of 20 nucleotides. And to give you a perspective, uh, mRNA, messenger RNA that encodes for proteins, they usually at least several hundred nucleotides, uh, usually thousands of nucleotides. MicroRNAs are from 18 to 25 nucleotides, so they are really very small. Uh, but extremely powerful. And they have been discovered only recently. Uh, in fact, as a class, they have been discovered in 2001, so 12 years ago. Now, uh, there are many of them in human genome. I believe now there are approximately 2,000 of microRNA genes discovered. And they express pretty much in all multicellular organisms and in some unicellular organisms as well. So, you know, everybody, Drosophila, C. elegans, uh, plants have their own repertoire of microRNAs. There are some microRNAs that are species specific, others that are evolutionary very, very well conserved. Means in Drosophila brain, you will find the same molecules that are expressed in human brains, the same microRNA molecules. Some of them are very tissue specific, means you can say that this mere X, you see this mere X, it means that you're dealing with uh, 
for example, muscle cells. If you see mere B, means that you're looking at liver cells. So there are some microRNAs that are really tissue specific, others that are expressed in various tissues. This can suggest their functions, either more specific or more uh, generic. So uh, they work post-transcriptionally. They regulate gene expression post-transcriptionally, which means they uh, regulate um, expression of mRNA to the protein. Practically, they bind to messenger RNA, usually within its untranslated uh, regions, uh, usually within the free prime untranslated region. So these are regulatory region in the messenger RNA, and they prevent their translation to a protein. So usually they are repressors of gene expression. They can also destabilize the message. So th there are several modes of action, but the outcome is that message is not producing a protein or producing less of the protein. They bind complementary to the message, to, uh, which means it's sequence-based binding. They don't have to bind perfectly to the message. Uh, so if they, uh, of if one microRNA is approximately 20 nucleotides, not they, you don't need the binding across all these 20 nucleotides. In fact, only seven or eight nucleotides binding is sufficient. So uh, what it means practically is that one microRNA can bind to many mRNAs, and usually many is dozens or sometimes even hundreds of messages, which means that a single microRNA can regulate expression of really large number of genes. And at the same time, uh, almost any mRNA can be regulated by a number of microRNAs, some, sometimes multiple microRNAs. And uh, it's really true for most of um, human genes, uh, as well as genes in plants and other animals. Uh, there are very few genes that are not regulated by microRNAs. Practically, it's a really huge layer of regulation that has been discovered relatively recently. So the first microRNA uh, has been discovered in 1993 by a group of Victor Ambrose. And um, these people are developmental geneticists. So they, they are interested, uh, they were interested in C. elegans and worms. Uh, and they, uh, worms are very good model systems to study development because the development in worms is very it's very timely. Uh, there are very clear stages and um, basically these people were trying to mutate different proteins and to see what proteins are uh, important for worm development. And uh, among many protein coding genes they encountered uh, one that they really couldn't understand what it's encoding for. And it turns out that it was encoding for really small mo RNA molecule of about 20 nucleotides which obviously could not uh, code for a protein, and this was the first microRNA discovered. Back then it was called small temporal RNA. Lean4 was the name. Uh, and for years, until late 90s, it has been regarded as sort of a very odd phenomena, something rather characteristic for worms, not for, you know, generally for animals, as was um, sort of um, regarded as a specific example of translational control, post-transcriptional control uh, in C. elegans. But then in um, 2000, the second similar molecule was discovered again in C. elegans uh, by uh, Gary Rafkin group, group. And it, in this case, this second micron it discovered was conserved from worms to humans. So at this moment, it was already clear that it's not just something about worms. Um, during the same um, years, late 90s, uh, related phenomena has been discovered, which is called RNA interference or RNAi. So RNAi is a process, basically when you can, when you add to the cell double-stranded RNA material, if it has uh, an endogenous target of identical sequence, this artificial material was re would, would repress uh, expression of the endogenous gene. And RNA interference has been again discovered in first in plants, then in C. elegans, but then it appears that it works everywhere. So basically people started to use it as a tool to uh, shut down gene expression. And it became very clear uh, quickly that microRNAs may represent mediators of this process. And at that moment people really started looking for 
microRNAs that are expressed within our genomes. And at the moment they started looking for them, they discovered them practically ever, everywhere. So at the end of 2001, three groups published first papers uh, about microRNA cloned from Drosophila, worms, and human cells. And they identify hundreds of them from the very beginning. And that's how the field really started. And it was a uh, sort of, you know, almost a revolution in molecular biology. People really talked about totally revolutionary kind of discovery because uh, it's a big class of molecules expressed across phylogeny. At that time, we really didn't know how it works and what it does, but it was clear because lots of these molecules were, again, conserved in the evolution that they are doing something. Uh, and this class has been missed for years. Well, I guess first reason, because we didn't look for them or scientists didn't look for them. Uh, of course, technology made a difference. They are very small, so it was not easy to detect them. Pra you know, some molecules that always run away from the gel because they are just too small. It's, you need special tools to detect them. And from this point, 2001, uh, a lot of scientists got involved in this field and um, started to study them. Over the next few years, it was a lot of tool development, technology development, methodology develop development, because just imagine there are hundreds of molecules expressed at large amounts in any cell of our organism that do something. We don't yet have tools to study them. So we needed to de develop tools, to, first of all, to detect them, and optimally not just to detect a single molecule, but to detect them in a mass. Because, you know, when there are 300 molecules expressed in our cell, in any cell, you can't start looking at each one of them separately. You want to get an, ex you know, impression how they expressed as a ma in a mass. And then you need the tools uh, to manipulate with them. Uh, increase their levels, decrease their levels, manipulate with them. And then, of course, you also need uh, tools to discover how they work. So you want to have some computational pipeline and to know how to how to predict their targets because again it quickly became clear that they these molecules work by regulating mRNA expression and these tools have been developed over years until now I would say lots of these tools are not optimal uh, the growth of it in this field is amazing. So, you know, uh, in 2003 or four, I could read every single paper about microRNA, and I sort of was almost confident I'm the only person in the world working on microRNA in brain. And then by now there are uh, tens of thousands of papers published every year, and uh, it grows, maybe not exponentially by now, but it grew exponentially over the last 10 years or so. And uh, there are symposiums on not only microRNA, but on microRNA in cancer and microRNA in neurobiology and microRNA in even in brain tumors. When I go to neuro-oncology symposiums, there will be probably a big session about microRNA in your oncologists because they are uh, regarded now very highly, not only as uh, molecules of biological interest, but also of a big therapeutic and diagnostic interest. Micron is indeed only a small layer of non-protein uh, non coding regulatory RNA mo molecules. There are many others. There are, there are long non-coding RNA molecules that also regulate gene expression transcriptionally, post-transcriptionally. They also uh, of huge interest for many scientists around. Uh, they are, I would say, less studied than micron at the moment, but this field is really exploring and it's amazingly interesting. <laughs>